Hey everyone, and welcome back to another video. So recently at the World Championships, Zeka had an absolutely insane performance. He went from being a relatively unknown mid laner to being by far the best performing mid laner at Worlds 2022. And I think what was really impressive about his gameplay was just how good his laning phase was. So I figured in this video, we'll do a deep dive. We'll look at a bunch of his different matchups and see what exactly he's doing so well. I think this is going to be a pretty long video, so I will timestamp all the matchups below. And I will also put a TLDR at the end if you don't want to watch the whole thing. But with that put aside, let's get into it. So our first matchup here is Akali versus Azir, and the way this matchup normally works is Azir gets to bully Akali pretty hard for most of the laning phase. Once Akali is maybe around level 9 and sort of getting close to her first item, that's when she really starts to take over. And just kind of your game plan as Akali in general versus most ranged champs is you're just trying to rush to that first item as quick as possible, and then you're really looking to take over the mid game. Uh, but you are really expecting to lose these laning phases, but in this one here, Zeka did some really clever stuff that actually ended up um, having him having control over the laning phase. So here at level one, comes and wards over here. This is completely fine. In fact, it's quite normal. If you're in a lane where you're not going to get priority in the early game at all, and you're not going to have the opportunity to go for any sort of wards like this, you can just come here and ward at level one. Now, in most uh, melee versus range matchups, you want to not order the wave early because what ends up happening is if you order the wave in the early game, um, it'll actually end up pushing to your opponent and you really don't want that, right? Like the way most of these melee versus range matchups work, you try to keep the wave mostly on your side. Um, what is probably going to happen is the range champion crashes three waves and then bounces back and it can be quite difficult for the melee champion. So what Zeka did here was actually really interesting. So what he did is he actually came up and started pushing and I was thinking like wait a minute like this looks really like really odd because like normally if you do this in like 90% of uh, melee versus range matchups you're going to end up in a really bad spot because what the range champion can do is they can just let it push to them and then it ends up frozen here and there's not really much you can do. However, and this I think was really smart, is Azir is one of the only champs I can think of that has not only constant harass, but constant harass that actually pulls aggro of the creep wave. So the thing is, even though this wave is going to push um, like to Azir at the moment, if Azir doesn't do anything, if Azir wants to harass Akali, he has to use his W, right? And that's going to draw a creep aggro. Now, there are lots of champions that can draw a creep aggro, you know, and we think of like level one Victor, if Victor walks up and cues Akali, like he's going to draw a creep aggro as well, right? Um, or if you're playing a champion that has a skill shot, like you might hit Akali and the wave. So those are kind of ways that the wave might push back to your opponent. But the thing is, those aren't really constant harass. It's like there's a cooldown between your skill shots or like Victor Q, it has a long cooldown, right? But the thing with Azir is that if he wants to punish you, he has to hit you constantly. And so what's that, what that is going to mean is that Azir doesn't actually really have a choice. Um, if he wants to harass Akali, like the wave is going to push back to her. And what this ends up doing, and you'll see this in a moment, is that rather than Azir being able to just like slow push three waves, build them up and crash them under tower and have it bounce back is because Zeka actually walks up and thins out a lot of this wave knowing that Azir is going to end up pushing this wave into her anyway the wave actually ends up in a much better position to her so I thought this was really really insane matchup knowledge like normally I watch a lot of these um a lot of these matchups and it's like okay yeah they just have like really strong fundamentals but this this really spoke to me as like wow this guy has like some really insane matchup knowledge because Knowing that Azir, probably like one of these only, only, yeah, one of the few champs that despite pushing into them is still going to be like forced into pushing to you, I thought was like really smart. Obviously, like the creep aggro thing is, is not really like anything revolutionary in itself. It's just like if you do this versus other champs, it's, it's just not really going to work. And so what you can see is rather than this third wave here crashing under the tower and then Azir just gets like a ton of time to harass and then it ends up bouncing back to him, instead... The wave's actually all the way out here, which is like, you know, it's still on Akali's side, so she still gets to farm it, but it's not completely under a tower. So she, um, Azir can't just like hit the Akali for free. And it also means that Akali is going to be level three. So she can either do two points Q or put a point in E by the time Azir is actually harassing under the tower. Because another thing that normally happens is when Azir crashes this under tower, it's normally level three versus level two. And Akali doesn't really have too much threat until she has like either, you know, again, two points Q or has a point in E or whatever. Um, but actually, like what's going to happen is that she can see us this wave a lot easier than normal just because the wave is crashing one wave later. And the whole reason that happened was because of the really smart level one. So I don't even know how many times he would have played this matchup to figure that out, but I have not seen anyone else do that. So I was like insanely impressed by that. 
Of course, we do still have some fundamentals at play. We've got the classic in the melee versus range matchup of looking to trade HP in order to ensure a better wave state. And something you will notice here is that Akali does have fleet and second wind, so pretty much as much... Uh, healing or as much sustain as you can get. Also has Bloodline, which I didn't even notice until now, but I suppose that is a little bit of extra sustain on top of it. But as they are, sorry, Akali is actually in a much better position here than you would normally be. So the thing is, in a lot of these matchups, right, it's very like your opponent, they either have enough mana to get you to zero or they don't. And I know that sounds sort of weird, but the thing is because your regen has increased, like when you're low HP because of Doran Shield, right? If you can't actually kill your opponent, you can only get them down to 10% HP, then the problem you run into is they just keep out sustaining your mana regen at that point. And because he was able to survive and able to play out this matchup just a little bit better than everyone else, he's actually in like a much better spot. Like even though it looks like, I know it looks very bad right now, but actually Azir doesn't really have enough mana to do anything about this. So what should normally be a matchup where Azir has like a pretty significant advantage early and then um, Akali kind of starts to recuperate it once she has like some levels and once she has like her first base and stuff is instead a matchup where Akali is actually bullying out the Azir and like Chovy is no slouch in the laning phase guys like Chovy he is he's a good laner for sure so the fact that Akali is the one forcing Azir to base in this matchup is really really impressive so here Azir bases Akali chooses to match this is pretty normal um, there's not really too much to it if she chooses to push it in, Azir can freeze it here, but instead, like, she can TP back, she'll have the same items or perhaps even better items and actually be able to push this in. It's also really good if you can force Azir to base first, because if you're the one choosing the bases, it, it really stops um, Azir from getting those items that he really wants. You know, if we're thinking about, like, what are the really big uh, kind of, like, components that Azir could get in this matchup, you know, Lost Chapter would be the big one if he could stay in lane that long, or he could maybe go Oblivion Orb, but I'm not the biggest fan of that, but it is an option that a lot of people have been going, or you might see like two amp tomes and a pink or something like that. But what we've actually done here is Akali's reduced um, Azir's combat power quite a bit. Like all he's bought here is the amp tome and the boots, which is not a particularly threatening buy in terms of combat power, right? And a lot of the time, if you're playing a melee champ, these kind of, especially a melee champ that is expected to lose early, if you can force your opponent to base kind of earlier in the game as opposed to a bit later when they have stronger components, they actually kind of lack the combat power to actually fight you. So this is really, it's just like advantage after advantage building up. And this is something that you're going to see in a lot of the other matchups um, that we're going to go through um, of Zekka's replays. He is probably the best three levels of any player at the moment, I think, out of mid laners. And what that means is that he pretty much always bases in an advantageous state. And that just makes playing out the rest of his matchup significantly easier. The fact that Akali is the one getting priority in this matchup and warding Raptors, it may not seem like the biggest advantage in the world. And honestly, it's not, but it's more just like particularly impressive that this is a matchup where it should actually be going the other way. But Akali already kind of has the, has the advantage over Azir, which is just... I, I can't stress it enough. It's really insane matchup knowledge from level one to know that if you can walk up like that versus Azir specifically, they're still going to push into you. And actually, it's going to end up like the wave knock white under your tower. And then because of that, you're a bit healthier than you could be. And because you're a bit healthier, like you get the better base. Um, so really, really nice. Now here, Zeka did decide to let this wave come to him. Um, the enemy support was around mid, so you kind of have to give up pressure in this situation. Kind of just like meta push to you, especially while your support is showing bot. But it's not like you're really expecting much to happen here. You're just kind of, you know, expecting to kind of chill out, farm up a bit. The wave on her, on the Akali side here, does make it a bit easier for her to like look for an all-in, but the problem is Azir is a bit too high HP to actually threaten that all-in, so Azir doesn't feel particularly threatened at the moment, and this is probably a kind of annoying situation for Zekka, where he doesn't have any vision in the river, and so Azir doesn't feel threatened at all, and can just poke her under tower, um, but eventually here, Viego will re-enter the river, and from that point, the, uh, the Azir will start to feel kind of threatened. Now, here's another thing that's really important. When you're in these like assassin matchups, right? When you're playing a melee versus range, typically you are a lot better in these early skirmishes than range champions, particularly if you can make sure that they base on not great items, right? Like a big advantage range champions normally have over the melee champions is one, they're probably pinning them to tower. They might be getting them low. And also they normally have an item advantage for most of the early game. But here we're coming to a skirmish where Akali is, you know, reasonably healthy. She's not too low to fight. She has basically the same items as Azir. And because of that, she's just going to be way more impactful in this fight um, than an Azir can ever hope to be, which is exactly the kind of situation that you want as a card. You don't really want to be, you know, just stuck in a laning phase against one of those poke gems. 
So it comes in here, gets a kill, and manages to get out. So very, very nice. And I think Azir actually gets chunked out here. Can't quite remember. I do believe so. Oh, Azir actually died. Okay, so yeah, now Meta's in an extremely good spot. Can just look to shove this in and go for a reset. And suddenly, this is the time that Akali would normally start to kind of recuperate her losses against Azir. It's like, you know, you're level 7, you're starting to get some decent combat power, and like we can start really pressuring our opponent and taking over. But actually, we've just got not just like a not just a lead in terms of matchup at this point we're actually ahead like just in terms of combat power if you look at the items right now so akali is feeling in a really really good position here um and at is this kind of like a, a point where the matchup starts to swing where azir no longer feels like he can harass akali for free you know where he's kind of like forced to cs um, as opposed to harass a lot of the time like you can see here that azir is mainly using his w's just to cs the wave because he is a little bit scared of the akali um can maybe go in and know if she uses cooldowns, but for the most part is, you know, staying back like that and just forced to CS. And like, once you get to this point as a Kali, um, there's really not too much to be scared of because your opponent is just focusing on using like all their cooldowns to CS the wave. So here, Azir once again does go to the Herald early, is trying to use that priority, but maybe is starting a little bit earlier. And I think from what I remember, this fight doesn't go particularly well for them, but all during this time, um, there are waves dying mid, which typically favors the melee champion because, once again, the range champion really needs to build up a uh, lead in the laning phase to be useful, and if they don't get that, it's it's like certainly much better for the assassin. So this fight, it's kind of whatever. End up just going back mid, getting pushed on the wave, and we're kind of chilling from this point. So honestly, there's not too much more to this lane, and if you look at the advantage here, it's not game-breaking, right? It's definitely not game-breaking, but it is a pretty significant lead, considering that this is a bad matchup. And if you've actually watched a lot of the games at Worlds, you would see, typically, in this matchup, Akali is like 1 HP hugging her tower for like the majority of the early game, and sometimes they have a big performance in the mid-game, but the fact that he is just ahead in the early game over one of the best Aziz in the world, it's really, really good. So to kind of recap this, obviously, there was a little bit of like... Um, you know, part of this is obviously a team effort, right? Like forcing skirmishes around these objectives is very good for Akali. It's more something that you might react to in solo queue as opposed to preparing, but like you should still look for them. But the really impressive thing was how he played those first three waves. Walking up, knowing Azir is going to push this wave anyway, or, or it's kind of like forced into pushing the wave just because his W draws creep aggro, and that meaning the wave is going to push to him was really, really nice. Also, I think like going for the like full sustain runes was quite smart. Um, the fact that you can be like reasonably healthy um, at these kind of positions like you know if you're say uh, 50 or 40 percent HP here if when you come to this dragon you actually end up dying because if you guys remember he got out on one HP so actually having all the extra sustain runes did go a pretty long way in order to um, like help the skirmishes and help the matchup so I thought this was like extremely impressive I'm not sure if you guys think that as well but I just think the, the first three waves were, were really impressive. But anyway, I think that's enough for this game. So let's go on to the next one. All right, game number two here is Silas versus Victor. And one thing I actually wanted to point out straight away is there was actually a little bit of adaptation. So the previous game I just showed you was from the Gen G series. Um, and as you saw, like Zeka, he's always going for that Raptor ward at level one if he can't get priority on his lane. Um, so what T1 actually did here is they warded this bush, probably knowing the Zeka was going to sit in here and go and ward the bush. So this doesn't really impact the laning phase, but I did think it was like pretty cool adaptation. So I guess it was something that the T1 coaches might have noticed and then said like, okay, we're just going to ward this, see if he's actually going to do this. Now, it was kind of interesting that Faker didn't look to kind of punish him. He actually valued push on the wave instead. I thought that was kind of interesting because I do think you can get push in this matchup anyway, if you want. Um, as Victor and I don't think like pushing this really does too much for you but I don't know it's definitely a choice right he does end up getting the ward this wave is going to be pushing back to him he doesn't go for I think the same level one thing as he did in the Azir game because again uh, Victor is not one of those champs like Victor he will just Q auto you and then he can pretty much sit back and let the wave come to you. Obviously, he can put more autos on you if he wants, but like the majority of this trade does come from that Q auto. So it's not like a Zero where you have to harass constantly. Um, so the wave could end up in a very bad state. Once again, has gone for pretty much all early game runes, got the second wind. Um, also has the D mount, which is going to be kind of useful here as well. So in the early game is just going to be letting this push to you. Now, something I want to kind of bring up straight away is he is very... Uh, he very consciously, I think, trades, he tries to CS the creep and trade with his opponent. So this is something I've brought up before, I think, on Akali, like maybe in my Akali um, guide, is that it's much more pressuring if you can order the creep and then like either queue the creep and your opponent at the same time, or if you can like, you know, just order the creep and queue your opponent. Um, 
than it is to say sit back and cue the creep because like what that kind of tells your opponent is that you're too scared to walk up um you don't feel like you can trade and what they can do is start playing really aggressively the zeka here he he's okay to take a little bit of damage you know he's got the door and shield he's got the second wind and he is just able to um, actually order these creeps and then use his Q on Victor, which is really nice because I think a lot of the time in these sorts of matchups, I do just see Silas kind of sit back and Q the creeps. And honestly, like it's it's okay because you're not really expecting to kill Victor, but I do think it's like it kind of just allows Victor more space over the lane than what you would expect. Like I think again, you would expect a lot of Silas's to just Q this creep, but instead he is trying to get the creep and Victor every time. And that's just buying him a little bit of extra space. And honestly, this extra space it does really add up just taking a little bit of like less damage um every time in these matchups it makes a really big deal because like i said before like a lot of these matchups if you if they can't quite get you low enough to actually finish you off um and you just kind of stay in the lane on like 10 percent health um the whole time there's not too much they can actually do about it you know your health regen ends up like outpacing um their mana regen so this is more what we we're expecting the kind of uh range versus uh sorry the melee versus range matchups to go so this was very different than last game right last game he was actually able to cs on the tower like pretty well without taking too much damage he obviously though is forced into taking a lot of extra damage so there's not much you can do about this unfortunately um i guess like yeah i guess if your opponent is gonna push to you anyway somehow you know they're gonna push either because of their champion or just because they might be making a mistake you could greed the level one like zeka did last game but i think that was very seer specific and again like i want to say the matchup knowledge to know stuff like that very very impressive so taking a lot of damage here but honestly it's not too bad like azir or sorry victor here he is relatively no mana and zeka still has his health part so as long as he plays around his health carefully he's probably gonna be fine here i would say this game there hasn't really been anything revolutionary this is kind of just like pretty solid fundamental uh, melee laning phases i do think that he does a pretty good job of like making sure he doesn't take too much extra damage you know a lot of the time if you take one extra q order like say you walk up here and you take this q order it can really put you in trouble right but he always makes sure just to take the bare minimum damage which is really really nice actually did go for the two points Q as well so probably just like wants a little bit more uh, wave control here now this is where you're going to see the DMAT come into effect so DMAT is there's a lot of ways you can do DMAT like I've, I've talked about it before like you can just DMAT cannons um, to kind of like cheese a wave of priority you can DMAT like range creeps or melee creeps to allow you to clear the wave easier um, but one way he used it here was he actually just used it to make sure that this was a bit more difficult to freeze so if this pushes in slower it becomes much easier for Victor to freeze because the next wave will be here sooner um, and this wave will eventually be thinned out and be a bit smaller but actually by using his DMATs here just to like help clear this wave like you can see DMATs a full HP range creep there it is going to make this a bit more difficult for uh, the Victor to hold it here and there was also something that comes up in just a moment I think was really really smart so right here right it's like you would kind of expect Victor in this situation to kind of walk down just W the wave like that's kind of your standard in this position it would look to freeze it now I'm not sure if he did this on purpose but it actually ended up working in his favor so he based in a pretty greedy spot um and Faker actually knew this so what he did was he's like okay I'll come over and cancel the base but I actually think it was kind of bad by Faker because it actually ended up messing up his freeze like you can see not only did he he, he instantly lost his ward so that's kind of like it's not um it's not crucial i guess to have a ward as victor on the map right now because you're not expecting too many ganks around mid this early but just like losing your ward for free it does kind of suck um but more importantly here you can see so he uses w probably should have walked down instead but actually instead comes over to cancel this base and this ends up breaking his freeze gets the ward once again goes for a greedy base and so Baker again comes over to cancel it but during this time zek is not actually losing anything and the wave is actually ending up pushing back to him so rather than victor having the freeze that he would like look to have it's it's hard to tell if this was like conscious by zeka or if it was just like a mistake by faker but either way the base did actually end up like faker was baited by it, i guess and, and came over to cancel it and what that ends up is like he actually has a pretty good um wave state here rather than it being frozen and being forced to tp back and then try and crash a frozen wave he's actually tping back to a lane pushing to him which is going to be quite nice because victor in this situation if the wave is frozen outside victor's tower victor can kind of just stay for a while if he wants to try get a bigger buy right like he could maybe try greed for lost chapter or something because it's going to be quite difficult for silas to crash it anyway but in this situation um the silas is actually going to be able to bully the victor quite a lot because the wave is pushing back to him and so victor has a choice it's like either you base on like somewhat mediocre items um and then you can come and crash this wave or you try and stay but you're gonna like lose a fair amount of creeps while you're at it so Faker does elect to stay but in the meantime 
there's no real harass put onto the Silas, and the Silas actually has, like, a completely fine state here. Like, he's not being harassed at all. He's just, like, getting to farm for free. You actually see that he's, like, about to catch up with uh, the Victor in CS, which is, like, really quite crazy, right? Again, trying to pin this Victor in lane, really trying to, like, not let him get a base. Um, because the longer you can kind of keep Victor in the state, the less harass you're going to take. Like, again, you're expecting in these, like, melee risk range matchups that you are going to take quite a bit of harass for free. Um, but instead, if you can keep your opponent locked into lane like this after he messes up that initial freeze, you kind of just get to free farm. Um, so you actually see, like, starting to pull ahead of the Victor in CS and actually maintaining priority in a matchup where you shouldn't really get it. Very, very impressive. So this kind of all stemmed um, partially from Faker's mistake, but potentially also from the, the basing here. It ended up being smart. Again, not sure if he did it 100% um, on purpose, but also the early game, just like making sure that he didn't uh, like walk into Faker like too often, just like making sure to take the bare minimum damage while was really, really good. Now here, goes for the base. It's going to be able to get back here in time. So actually being up in items over Victor uh, is like pretty impressive. Also, I do think that Faker maybe didn't spend his gold on the best items here. Like I think tier two boots in this matchup is perhaps not the best. Um, like, I don't think they really do a whole lot for Silas. There's an argument that they help you kite him out. Uh, but I do think just, like, having more harass with the with the mana um, or more AP would be better. Now, this is an interesting point of the lane because um, once Victor starts getting a lot of... You guys will know this if you've first Victor before. But once Victor starts getting a lot of points in laser, it becomes quite hard to lane pretty much no matter what champion you're playing because his poke just starts becoming so strong. So... At this point in the lane, he kind of does some really interesting stuff to kind of bridge this gap of like Victor having a lot of points in his laser, but Silas still not really being at that kind of that like critical point where Victor is too scared to harass him. So you'll see that he kind of like bridges each wave with something. So I'll show you what I mean. So wave one here just ults the wave, it's going to crash it and uh, doesn't take too much damage for it. So that's wave one and that's like looking really good, right? Then comes down here and takes the honey fruit. So back to full HP, full mana, and he's going to essentially trade all this HP and mana to kind of bridge another wave. So rather than just like sitting here, giving up priority and taking a lot of damage, he's just going to trade a bunch of health um, that he just got from that honey fruit to kind of get control of this wave. Okay. So that's like the second wave bridged. Here it comes up, takes another honey fruit. So once again, has a lot of HP that he can use for something. And this is more of a competitive situation, but actually uses his support to bridge another wave. So um, Beryl comes mid, gets a big chunk on Victor, which again, puts him in a really good spot. So like what he's actually done here is this kind of scary period of like Victor having a lot of points in E and Silas like not really being strong enough yet to actually do anything about it. He's like bridged the gap really well. Wave one with Victor ult, wave two with a honey fruit from bot side and wave three with a combination of honey fruit from top side and his support. And that's like made this just so much easier and you can actually see once again is up cs in a matchup where he kind of has no right to which is which is really really good honestly and that's something you're going to see all throughout these matchups is he pretty much always um is getting these advantageous bases in matches where he shouldn't through some like really clever mechanics you know like or not mechanics some really clever like game knowledge you know like in game one it was like that really smart first three waves and here it was like knowing how to bridge that gap of time really really well and also the base here like making victor kind of mess up his freeze all this has led to a situation where he is significantly ahead in combat power compared to victor um, and that's going to kind of, again, like help him get through this kind of stage of the lane where you're maybe expecting to take a lot more harass than you can really deal with, you know, when your sustain from second win and Dorian Shield just doesn't really, doesn't really do enough. So, walks in here, unfortunately, the fight goes like sort of not well for him, but is sitting at a 20 CS lead, which is pretty, pretty nice. Um, not much to it here with his support, kind of like looking top and the enemy support in his lane is unfortunately going to take like a fair amount of damage here. But the thing is, it does have TP, so you can afford to take quite a bit of damage here and not worry too much about it. So some trades onto Victor, but it doesn't really matter. Now this I thought was quite interesting. So after this trade onto Victor, right, you're kind of expecting like, okay, he might go for a base. He's got chunk pretty low, but this I think was really good adaptation. So once again, if your opponent kind of lacks the damage to actually get you down to like you know, 5% HP or something, your regen from like second win from Doran Shield will just keep you in the lane. So what he did here, he did start the base. And I think he was going to base, but once he saw that Victor really wants to crash this wave, especially after this E has been used, uh, Faker is now too low on mana to really do anything about it. So he can actually just stay in the lane for longer than he would normally be allowed. 
This is honestly a very difficult situation to play out if you're Faker because the thing is, you don't have TP up yet because you TP'd to lane later than your opponent did, but your opponent does. So the kind of problem that you have here is like, if you try and fast push it immediately, your opponent can just stay. If you try and keep it in the middle, then your opponent TPs back and freezes it. So it's in a really difficult position, mainly because he used his um, TP a bit later than Zekka did. And so what that's again is going to allow is for him to get to farm like a few more waves than he really should be allowed to. So clears out the wave, is taking some harass, but once again, Baker is too low on mana to kill him. You can see here is like pretty much down to one HP. And again, Zek is just making, he's not really under any threat here as long as he has the ability to get out. Um, you can see he's saving his E here um, to make sure like a victor at Ultimate or something, he would able, be able to get out still once again. Baker zero mana, stays in lane, so he's like, he's, he's very, I want to say greedy, but it's not even greedy, because he just like knows his limits well, and so, once again, like, we're in a position where you're expecting the melee champion to kind of be behind the curve compared to a ranged champion, and that's kind of like, you know, once you hit your one item, that's when you can start kind of beating out the ranged champion, right? But you're expecting to hit your one item later than your opponent, but pretty consistently is actually reaching the point where he is stronger in the mid game before his opponent is. And on top of that, he's almost like skipping a lot of the bad laning phase where you're expected to be kind of like pushed in, pressured under tower, um, just by some really smart wave control and also like clever game mechanics, stuff like the honey fruit. So I guess to kind of TLDR this one, this one was a bit more fundamental than the last one. Um, I think it was like mostly just like solid laning fundamentals, but I do think the base here, if you did it on purpose, was very, very intelligent. I also think the use of like Victor R and Honeyfruit to bridge that really scary part of the lane was really, really nice. Um, and also good adaptation to like Victor using a lot of mana on the wave allowed him to actually stay in lane um, longer than he needed to. So Zekka's, Zekka's melee versus, I just want to watch this real quick. I've seen it before, but I need to watch it again. It comes down here, and I mean, just at this point, it's like really over for Victor. Like, so is just gonna be way more impactful. So, Zekka's laning, especially his melee versus range laning, is insane. Like, he has probably the best um, melee laning of any mid laner I've seen, at least at Worlds 2022. So, we're gonna go over to some other types of matchups now, but I think there's a lot to take away from these melee versus range matchups. Um, and definitely, like, there's some stuff you can incorporate into your gameplay as well. For our third match here, we have Ari up against Silas. So this is a pretty interesting matchup. A lot of people pick Silas into Ari for a couple reasons. One, Ari doesn't have the best laning phase in the world. Like it's fairly average as far as laning phases go. And that means Silas can get a somewhat free lane, which is normally very good for Silas because once he reaches one item, he kind of just starts to destroy everyone. Um, another reason is obviously Ari ultimate is quite good on Silas and then maybe another reason that's just like a little less important is Silas does have a dash and a lot of like champs without any dashes do sort of suffer versus Ari because you get charmed and easily killed um, by Gangsta but uh, yeah, Silas kind of has ways to deal with all these things and can take advantage of some of Ari's weaknesses. Now, I thought what was really interesting is that Zekka actually went for a lot of early game power. He actually went for the Aerie and Scorch and the reason I think this is quite interesting is because a lot of Ari's trading power, it comes from her skill shots, right? It's normally um, about like hitting a charm on someone and then following up with Q damage or hitting the Q um, when they're going for a creep or something. Basically, it's it's dodgeable damage for the most part, right? Um, but doing this and starting W, I mean, starting W into melee is sort of normal, but adding in the Ari and the Scorch, it's kind of loading more of that damage into unavoidable damage, which is actually quite good versus Silas. Um, and I'll talk about this at the end. There's actually like a little bit of metagaming in terms of runes uh, at this Worlds, which I thought was very interesting. I'll talk more about that at the end because it's kind of its own topic. But anyway, this will be kind of um, more indicative of how or rangers matchup, ranged versus melee matchup should normally go. So you can see here, just getting a slow push is going to be looking for probably a three or two wave crash in this situation. And um, you're going to see starts W, does make a lot of sense, also can proc the area and the score. So a lot of extra damage that goes out um, on these trades. Now versus Silas at level 1, it does depend a little bit what ability he starts, like you're kind of expecting him to start Q or E, and whichever one he starts does kind of impact how you play. If he starts Q, you can play quite aggressively. If he starts E, you can still play aggressively, but you need to kind of play near the creep wave. So 
In this situation has gone for actually fast pushing two waves. To be honest, it doesn't make a huge difference whether you want a two wave crash or three wave crash in this situation because um, of what has happened with the junglers this game. So uh, something that ended up happening is a Kindred started blue and is invading the Graves' red and Graves is doing the same on the opposite side. What this means is the map is split. So you will know that for the next like five or so minutes that Graves will always be bot side and Kindred will always be top side. So what that means is you can pretty continually push your opponent onto tower and as long as you're playing in this area here you can always walk up and you will never be gankable by graves so this is probably something that you wouldn't do if you're versus stronger ganking jungler like if it was something like jarvan like a split map jarvan could potentially still gank mid although yeah you could maybe still avoid it but either way because you know that uh, the map is split like this as long as you heavily hug to top side you can actually just continually push waves um, until you have a big enough advantage that you want to freeze it so you can see here this is very different by the way to how the previous game was where if you remember, the Akali was actually under tower, not taking too much harass, but here, like he's actually being zoned off of creeps, like he's been zoned off one there, is uh, looking to get harassed like on pretty much every creep here, like a few auto attacks coming out. So this is very, very different compared to that first game, which is, or that second game, um, with what Zeka did with that wave control at uh, level one. So I thought that was really, really cool. Okay, so got a little few autos and is actually gonna keep pushing here so you could let this come back to you but honestly it's kind of better to keep it pushed i think like you don't really have enough of an advantage yet to really justify bringing it back like chovy's managed to avoid a lot of the damage and again like you're not really under threat of any ganks like you can just like sit here and there's not too much um you can do also against some melees you would want to let this push back out to you anyway um but silas like isn't that strong until like around like yeah level five level seven um, so for the most part here, can just continually push under tower and harass. And this is a lot like how the Azir Akali matchup should have looked as well, um, if not for the really clever wave control early. So I'd say so far, nothing really different has changed here, although I would say his adaptation to the split map and the jungle matchup was really, really nice to allow him to get like a couple of extra advantages. Um, so it looks like Silas was baiting the base, which caused Ari to use some of her cooldowns on the wave. Now, here's kind of another interesting thing. So it actually goes for the base first. Um, obviously, you can stay longer, but once again, this is one of those matchups where um, if you can kind of... Oh, I actually came to the base. I don't remember that. I was going to say, like, if you can force uh, a base at a certain, like, item breakpoint, and it still matters here. So, like, for example, um, item breakpoints might be, you know, Lost Chapters 1300. That's the big one. Um, you know, there's, like, Fiendish Codex at 900. There's, like, Blasting 1 to 850. There's, you know, Boots plus Dark Seal at 650. There's all these different, like, item breakpoints, right? And so, like, in this matchup here, um, your kind of item breakpoints pretty much are you can do, like, Lost Chapter, you can do Oblivion Orb and stuff like that. Um, but crucially, Oblivion Orb is not something that Silas can do, but Oblivion Orb is something that Ari can do. So, here you'll see that Silas base is with somewhat mediocre items um, and I think the reason that Silas actually matched this base is because he just used so much mana on the wave he kind of has to in fact I think what would have happened here is Zekka most likely would have committed to this base if he had seen Silas um, keep his mana here but uh, ultimately Silas uses all his mana so now knows that he can stay a bit longer and actually get Silas's TP out first also uses demat on the cannon which is very nice so dematting cannons is a really good way to reset as well which we've talked about before so clears this wave um silas probably looks to pull this she does um but you'll see here that the item advantage is oh actually decided to clear the wave okay so he decided to clear the wave because they were thinking about contesting this crab um this does make ari's late base kind of annoying because they are gonna have to end up giving this up so it actually maybe would have been better to commit to this base rather than canceling even though you got an extra wave ultimately it does end up meaning that you give up this uh this scuttle crab here so maybe not the best but Anyway, bases, buys the Oblivion Orb. So once again, I am honestly not really a big fan of Oblivion Orb. But the one thing I do like about Oblivion Orb is that it's a good way to just spend all your gold essentially on combat power. You know, um, I think it's if, if you'd gone something like Amtome Boots here, it maybe wouldn't be the best. I think there's an argument that like Amtome Mana Crystal isn't the best here because Ari doesn't have like great mana issues so really the choice would be like i do want two amp tomes i'm not sure if he had quite enough for two amp tomes or not i probably would have preferred two amp tomes but ultimately i think oblivion orb is one of the better buys here just because it's spending all that gold on stats that are really going to help you with trades if we look at this once again i think boots not really that impactful versus ari honestly like you either you either dodge the Q, like Ari's Q, with your E, or you kind of get charmed and then you get hit by Ari's Q anyway. So I'd be kind of surprised if the boots actually made a meaningful 
difference in this matchup. I guess there's like an argument that you can like chase Ari down maybe, but the problem is that you don't have enough combat stats otherwise to like make up for it. You know, like if you have more combat stats than Ari and you have the movement speed, then it's really easy to chase her down, right? But the problem is if you try and trade on Ari and she just like trades back better than you, then that's going to be really difficult. And that's kind of what you're going to see here. So um, you actually see that the boots don't really end up having an effect. And so kind of just end up, they're not 300 gold wasted, but it's like 300 gold deficit kind of at this point in the lane. So it's the charm, gets off quite a bit of damage here onto Chovy. Um, and is gonna probably just hug the top side like you have a lot of vision there i also think you this is like a, a more general thing if you're buying oblivion orb you do need to be quite careful how you use your mana like you can use your mana to kind of secure an initial push which is kind of what happened here because obviously like if we want to build an advantage we want the lane pushing to our opponent right but we do need to be careful like how much mana we use like from here on out we kind of need to just like focus on like ordering the wave perhaps using our cheaper spells like w and you'll actually see here that like He's trying to build the wave as opposed to immediately crashing this because it's going to cost him more mana. Um, and also, like, the longer he keeps this wave out here, the bigger he can build it up, gives him more time to harass under tower and everything like that. And it also forces Silas to use some of these cooldowns out here. So overall, good adaptation. And something that you're going to see soon is that once he actually gets a significant chunk onto Silas, he is actually going to change his plan. He's going to start looking to um, instead, like, crash the wave. So mostly keeping the wave in the middle at the moment. Nothing too special. Still doing a little bit of harass. The airy scorch. King. Yeah, so Kindred's going bot here. Gets another like kind of nice trade onto Silas. So far, I don't think the Oblivion Orb has done much. Maybe it's reduced a little bit of the health regen, but ultimately it's not super impactful. You can see though this wave is still building up, so eventually you kind of get to cash in on this when it crashes under tower. Now I think here is kind of where Chovy made a really I think it was here, like made a really big mistake. He yeah it's this one here so i want to just like point out why this is bad so like once again like we remember that ari has like quite a few more combat stats than silas does here on top of that like ari has more sustain in her passive and also she has two potions versus one and maybe on top of that as well like silas has first strike rather than conqueror so perhaps isn't the strongest here and is also putting points in q like normally when you're going q max silas right you're focusing mainly on like poking and focusing mainly on pushing the wave like all those sorts of things but here kind of didn't play this and traded into a target that had more hp more sustain a bigger wave and more combat stats and ultimately this ended up going really bad for chovy he ended up going in using um his ariel but he pretty much just lost most of his hp and ari didn't even use her r and like a big problem with that is if you're playing against a champion that out sustains, unless you can kill you, or unless that you can like kill them then and there, normally you don't want to trade evenly with them because they're just going to out sustain you, right? Like now Ari's got her passive, she has two potions to burn through if she wants, and now it's really easy. And you'll see how like she adapts here. So before, this was like a slow pushed wave. There was like, yeah, there weren't like really any abilities being used on the wave. There was just like autos. Ari's not really doing much. As soon as uh, Chovy gets chunked here, the, it like immediately changed. Ari wants to crash this wave like pretty much as quickly as possible and just like spam harass under tower because she knows that Silas has like no meaningful way to actually trade with her at the moment. Um, he just like doesn't have the cooldowns, he doesn't have the HP to do so. And what's going to end up happening is that at some point, Silas is forced to just like give up a wave. And that's going to mean that he loses like quite a bit of CS. So you can see here, um, Silas is like trying to stay in wave because he or is trying to stay in lane because he really doesn't want to give up creeps, right? But the cost for that is like one, you have no pressure on the map, like you can't really help your graves, which is kind of important because this is like a graves versus kindred matchup, like there's going to be lots of invades and stuff. But also, you're bleeding a lot of CS on every wave. I think you're missing maybe like two or potentially three out of every wave, and that's really starting to build up here. So, yeah, it's like a really big advantage. And on top of that, eventually you are kind of going to have to accept that either you lose a wave, like at some point, because you're forced to base, or you're just like staying in lane, you know, bleeding plates, bleeding CS. You can't actually help your jungler with anything. So, yeah, that one trade from Chovy kind of did mess everything up. But I do think that the. Like the itemization and runes were honestly like pretty smart from Ari, like especially the base timing, like critically around that Oblivion Orb, I think was quite nice. Again, I'm not the biggest fan of Oblivion Orb, but I am a really big fan of like spending all your gold on combat stats and just like using that to win trades. Like if you actually think 
Um, again, I'm going to come back to this kind of at the end with the metagaming, but if you think of like how much extra power Ari has early here, it's like, you know, we've got the laying runes with the Aryan Scorch, we've versus like the scaling rune in the uh, first strike, and then in terms of actual combat power, we have like 1200 gold basically spent on pure like combat stats, where Silas is like significantly less than that, because I don't think boots really function um, kind of as a combat stat in this matchup, so comes the sweep and the top side. I think they were actually looking for the honey fruit here, but unfortunately um, was not up. This is kind of good though, even though Silas is going to get a base, Graves had to come mid to push it out with him, so that means they share gold and XP, and it also means that um, they waste a bit of Graves' time. So you can kind of see here, is in an insanely good spot compared to Silas, and actually, um, also if you look at kind of the gold that they based on, so once again, like, Chovy, he could he could buy the lost chapter here if he wants, and honestly, I would probably say that's better. Like, I, I think I would value uh, the lost chapter higher here, but ultimately goes for the Merc Treads. Once again, I don't think this is... I think this is really good itemization for the game. Like, there's triple AP, there's like Gragas, Arena Lux, and there's like a fair amount of CC, right? Um, so I think this is like a really good buy in terms of the game, but I think it's like a bit too early. Like the reason I think Mercs is really good against like double AP mid jungles, especially ones with CC, is because it's going to help you a lot with the early skirmishing, especially against champions where the movement speed makes a difference between like dodging their abilities or not. So champions like Syndra, or um, if you can kind of get out of their CC in time to avoid additional damage. So like if you can get out of LeBlanc's chain earlier, or if you can get out of Zoe's E earlier, or if uh, Syndra stuns you at max range, you can get out of range before um, the stun wears off, right? Or before she's in range to to actually hit you with something. So, but the problem with this is, I don't think the tenacity in this matchup really makes a difference with that. So you'll kind of see that, um, I think there's some point here where he actually gets charmed and just like takes the full damage anyway. So it's like, you know, I would say these Merc Treads, while they're, they're very valuable in terms of the game, it's almost like, 1100 gold for only 450 gold for the actual magic resist in terms of the matchup right now whereas on the other side like the lost chapter plus oblivion orb that's like you know th this is like pure combat stats like they definitely make a difference you can spam these abilities on cooldown and you just do more damage and on top of that it's like you also have this win con here where silas has less mana than you so if you wanted you could just spam waves in so you can see he gets charmed and actually gets all the damage off despite the tenacity so i really think um kind of just like yeah, there's like a bunch of things happening here. I do think this was more expected for how melee versus or range versus melee matchup should go. Uh, I do think there was like really smart adaptation in terms of the game state, in terms of like Silas wasting mana and then like they canceled their base, in terms of like Silas trading into that big wave and then looking to crash under tower. Um, but I also think the runes and itemization were just a lot better. So what would I take away from this one? I think biggest thing was probably adaptation. If you understand the fundamentals really well, you can kind of see when your opponent's making a mistake um, and you can adapt to that, right? Like obviously there's there's kind of core fundamentals we can like build our laning phase around, right? But at some point it's like you can adapt them to kind of get even more out of them. You know, we might want to continue pushing because we know we can't get ganked or we might want to cancel a base because we just saw our opponent use all their mana or, um, you know, we might want to start pushing when we should be slow pushing because our opponent just like traded all their health away or something. So really good adaptation, really good understanding of the matchup. And also I really like the itemization, just like spending all this on combat stats while Silas was spending on stuff. This perhaps a little less useful. For our fourth matchup here, we have Orianna versus Azir. Now, this is considered a counter pick. Azir is normally picked into Orianna, and the reason is that you can kind of constantly harass her, you outrange her, it's quite easy to gank her after six due to her immobility, and it's just sort of difficult for Orianna to trade back. However, there's some really interesting optimizations here um, that I think have happened. So the first thing is that normally in this matchup is Orianna. You're expecting it to take Corrupting Pot, and the reason is that, well, you're just going to be too low HP to do anything else otherwise, but... What he's decided here is he's been like, okay, I'm going to take Doran's ring, but I'm actually going to go for the second win to kind of prop that up. So normally you don't do this on Orianna because, well, um, there's just not that many situations you need it. But he's gone like, okay, I would rather have the stronger early game with Doran's ring plus a uh, second win than I would, say, having Corrupting Pot and a bit more scaling with, you know, maybe this being like Boots and Cosmic or something like that. Um, on top of that, he has gone for Aerie, but he didn't go for Scorch, which I thought was very interesting. Now, I'm honestly not sure what the reasoning was behind this. He might have been thinking like, okay, maybe you can't get a big enough lead in the early game to make it worth it, or he might have been thinking like he can't proc it often enough to be worth it. Personally, I think if I were committing to this full early game page, I would have taken Scorch, but honestly, I don't know what his thought process behind this was, so I don't want to just like assume and potentially give the wrong information, uh, but I am pretty confident in everything else here. I also think this is interesting because 
Um, as the Azir side of this matchup, because you outrange Oriana and because you can normally poke her fairly for free, you're not expecting to take too much damage in return. So normally you're going Doran's Ring because, well, if you play it properly, you probably don't need Corrupting Pot. And also, people tend to go very greedy runes in this matchup. They always go for like the full early game page. They go airy, they go uh, Scorch, and they even take Cheap Shot. Now, if you're expecting to take some more damage back, you might go Taste of Blood. But for the most part, Oriana doesn't get to hit you back that, that often because like normally you just poke with WQ. Um, and the problem is like if Oriana wants to walk past the WQ into trading range of you, um, she takes so much damage in, on the way in and then on the way out that it's just never worth it for her. So you're not expecting to take much damage back the zeka with his setup here has already been like you know i'm gonna have like more health here than people normally have i'm gonna have more ap here than people normally have and then tops it all off with a level one cheese so the thing is um in this matchup the weakest point for azir is actually at the level one and the reason for that is like at level two is once the range starts becoming a big problem for oriana you know once the wqs really start um piling up especially as azir gets more points in it actually like level three or level five it's really starting to be quite tough so what he's going to do here abuses level uh level one oriana advantage so this is something i think i've actually shown before um is that if you're in a matchup where you win level one you can actually use that to get control of these first three waves that's exactly what he does you can see abusing the level one oriana here if he places w can just walk back could even trade into it and then walk back like there's a lot of different options here right but by establishing control of the lane at level one it means one azir can't be the one hitting this wave first it makes it harder to three wave crash under the tower and just a bit more difficult to actually win trades because you can see that in this sort of situation uh the azir can only trade one auto to oriana's like q auto plus airy so there's like a lot more damage being put out here um and it's actually gonna give him like a fair amount of control over the lane because you can see um like the soldiers have already been placed down um has actually got the wave in like an even state as opposed to just a wave pushing in um early also really nice i actually quite like this is using the q on the wave to help push this back in he knows that if this wave just like immediately crashes he's actually going to take more damage in the long run than if he just uses some cooldowns and potentially gets punished for it um because like if you think about it right every time you use a cooldown there's a potential like window for you to get punished but azir isn't that great at punishing a level one it's mainly after level two um and also if azir can pin you to the tower like this that's when you get like super destroyed so if he can trade like a little a little less hp use his cooldowns maybe a bit differently in the early game to just keep this wave off the tower um it, it'll make like a really big difference and like this is an insanely different level one than you have seen in probably any oriana versus the matchup before like i don't think the i don't think any one of these things is like really revolutionary on its own right but it's like really the combination it's like okay taking the really early game setup and then like cheesing at level one you know like taking control of the lane making sure that this is actually an even lane state before level two um you know going for this like more aggressive setup thinking that azir is probably going to go for like cheap shot and doran's ring as opposed to um you know like corrupting pop with taste of blood or something like that so it's like a little mind game but also just like that's honestly really impressive matchup knowledge like it's more than just fundamentals like you can tell these are matchups this guy has played like a lot and and i wouldn't be surprised if he had like um experimented with some of the kind of like different setups and stuff like this really is is quite impressive to me kind of the level of almost like research um, that went into this. I, I can't imagine that it was just by chance that he happens to have these like really, I would say like good setups. Cause I actually think a lot of these games have been won through like really intelligent level one play um, or like really optimized like runes or itemization or stuff like that. So actually this is probably the first time I've ever seen an Oriana pushing in an Azir and chunking him out at level two. So I would actually encourage you to look up a, a normal Azir versus Oriana matchup and just see how normally the Oriana is like the complete opposite. Like normally Oriana is the one under tower just getting like absolutely destroyed. Um, but is actually kind of like keeping a lot of the pressure off himself just by like pinning his ear to this side of the lane is actually taking a lot less damage than than you would perhaps normally take and is honestly just destroying it like let's actually go back and just look at this so um obviously like when you're the one pushing in it makes things just a lot easier you have that level advantage you have that creep advantage it also makes it a bit more difficult for your opponent because they have like a bit less space to work with so all these are going to make it a lot easier for oriana to play is super super nice on top of that does have like all the extra sustain with the second win you can see here 60 healing already which is honestly like kind of kind of a lot um and yeah just like has a lot of advantages to work with here which feels really good the only thing you would have to be careful about maybe is like a Lee Sin gank but like if you can get Azir low enough it's kind of unlikely because Azir doesn't have gank set up 3-6 obviously 
um, as lead my gank maybe to just kind of fix the wave. But yeah, I mean, this is kind of just like mid lane domination at the moment. <laughs> There's really not much else to say. It's normally the complete opposite. I actually almost am tempted to put in and as the inverse Oriana VOD just into this video of my own because, uh, yeah, I mean, it does not normally go like this. Like, I, I definitely feel like when I'm picking Azir into Oriana that it's like a really free matchup. And I can't imagine if I were the one, you know, playing this matchup and suddenly my whole like matchup knowledge or whole knowledge of the matchup just like turned on its head in one go. So yeah, starting to build up a really big advantage. Actually has Azir pinned to his tower and is starting to like, you know, deny creeps. Is starting to like make it difficult to actually like stay under tower. And one thing that I'm, I'm going to bring up again at the end is that even in these bad matchups, right? Even in matchups that are considered counters, Zeka almost never, in fact, like I can't really remember a time, loses um, at first base. He's almost always basing with an advantage or has control of the first three waves. And in fact, I would go so far as to say as I think in those first three levels, and in fact, maybe particularly at level one, has like the best understanding of what to do. Because like a lot of these times, like understanding what to do with those first three waves and the level one was taken to a level that's like, you know, much higher level than like what other people have taken it to. Obviously, like there's pretty solid foundations to work with, but some of the like matchup specific openers that he's gone with have been like really, really intelligent as well as like all the, you know, runes and itemization on top of it. I mean, if you just like look at the state, um, the mid lane is in here, like Oriana being up 10 CS on Azir and then can just like match base again here. It's like, it's just such a good situation to be in. Once again, like if, if Azir is the one kind of being forced, like honestly, these are pretty good combat stats. Like Azir can use these like quite well, obviously, but normally Azir is expecting to kind of base with an advantage over Oriana, you know, have like a bit more combat power. Whereas here, it's like, you know, it probably still does have a slight advantage in combat power, um, but it's not like crazy, right? Like Oriana, she has the boots, which I think is, it's not too good versus Azir, but you kind of, you kind of need it in a way, um, just because like, otherwise you can't actually get in range. Of Azir, which is like kind of a problem. Um, but also the extra mana allows you to just trade with E on every trade, which is really nice. You can always like look for QWs instead of just Qs. So in a way, it does kind of translate. I, I would still say like Azir is probably advantaged at this stage of the match. Um, and you can kind of see that, right? Like the matchup is starting to go back in Azir's favor. But this is normally where it's starting to get like almost unplayable for Ori. Um, but with his really smart play in the early game, he's actually kind of managed to um, stave this off in a way. It's kind of like that matchup where he was playing Silas versus Victor. And like, you know, you're expecting that point where your opponent has like three points in E, or in this case, three points in the ZSQ, um, that it's going to be really tough. And and actually, he's like made that a lot more bearable for himself by just playing kind of the the time period before it much, much better. So, yeah, basically, now it does have a lot of mana. So that, that is one thing you can use here is like with the huge mana advantage he has is you can just like use a lot of spells on the wave and kind of uh, pin his ear to the tower. I don't think there's actually too much more to this matchup. Honestly, there's like nothing really eventful that happens and the like CS is pretty much even at 10 minutes. But I thought this was like a really good example of this is a matchup that honestly, it's not like horrible for Oriana, but it should go very differently um, to what I did here. And I think just the really intelligent runes and itemizations, the really again like really thought well thought out level one approach to the lane like completely changing how the matchup played out um and just the fact that he always has advantage on those first three waves and that first base even the matchups he shouldn't because of like clever things he does either yeah with that level one with his openers his itemization you know stuff like that it really makes a big difference like the level one matters a lot honestly like i was um i was actually coaching someone recently who uh played in the played in the lco like i did and I was kind of showing them like how much the level one matters. Like whoever has control of level one gets control of the first three waves. If you have control of the first three waves, that means you probably get a more advantage first base. If you have a better first base, like you have more items, it just makes everything so much easier. So yeah, really, really impressed by this game as well. For our final matchup, we had this game. I'm sure you guys remember this one, the Silas versus Akali game, um, where I think there was something like four or five solo kills over the course of the game. And um, a lot of it did kind of stem from one like really bad thing in the early game. So let's have a look at it. Um, now, the way this matchup normally works is that, um, let me get rid of the chat real quick. So Akali normally has the advantage over Silas in the early game. Um, Akali is just a stronger laner than Silas is. But what normally happens is that like as the lane goes on, as the game goes later, Silas just tends to do better into Akali. Once Akali kind of 
um, you know, gets to the point where she doesn't quite have the burst to kill Silas. Like, Silas definitely wins the extended trades. And also, once Silas gets the ability to kind of trade back, um, rather than just getting, like, poked for free, it becomes a lot easier. So let's see how it goes. Um, so at level one, like Akali is just going to push anyway. Um, there's not too much to this. Like I think if Silas could get pushed in this matchup, he probably would. But um, the problem is that like Akali just has like way too much push. And you're kind of just like, you're going to take a lot of damage like during the meantime. Obviously does have like quite a bit of sustain with the Doran shield. It was kind of interesting to me that he didn't go for any second wind or anything. Uh, but may have felt that it was like unnecessary. Um, obviously not too sure though. Does look for some trades early. Can be taking a little bit of damage back. There isn't like too much you can do here. Honestly, you're kind of just like expecting to, you know, take a bit of damage for CS. It's, it's not something that you're like too worried about. The main thing you need to be careful of is like how much damage you're going to take for kind of for free. Um, so if you like, let's see. So if you just like walk up and you take one auto for a creep, like that's probably fine, right? Also, if you can force cooldowns out or rather force, but like um, if you can bait cooldowns out, like that's really good. So like right here, for example, Kali's W has a very long cooldown. It's like 22, okay, 20 seconds. Um, so like if you can force out Akali's W for only like one Q, that's like quite a long cooldown, right? So that, that's like normally the way Akali's use W, if they use it aggressively, is they can use it to zone you off the creep wave for like a significant amount of time. They might be able to weave in some QRs and stuff like that. So if you can move aggressively into people like that, and bait out their cooldowns, it's really, really nice. Because here, um, with this Akali W on cooldown for such a long time, it's actually pretty problematic. A lot of Akali's go E second in this matchup. In fact, some even start E in this matchup. So I'm not the biggest fan of W second, honestly. Um, and I do think that ultimately kind of lets Zeka like zone Akali off the wave a little bit here. You can kind of see that like even though she has a bigger creep wave, just like without this second cooldown here, it's quite hard for her. And you can see she comes up to get this one creep, right? And for this creep, she ends up using one of her cooldowns and she takes a huge amount of damage for this. And W is still not ready. So this was an extremely good cooldown punish from Zeka, but also extremely greedy from Scout. Like this is like never worth it. If you actually look how much health was lost, this is a, a minion that's worth 14 gold, okay? 14. And so starts this trade off with 592, actually ends up falling all the way down to 275. So a huge amount of damage taken for a 14 gold creep and like that really turns this matchup from being like you know this should be quite good for Akali to now like actually we're not in trouble but it's definitely not as good as it was right like fights are gonna be a lot closer than they are um manages to get the little trade on her and get out there it was probably kind of scary to keep extending that given that she had w and also she was level three versus level two um now i do think there was a period of time here where it was somewhere in here where he actually kind of overextends and takes a little bit of extra damage. So one thing you have to be kind of careful of is that like, if you're going for like lots of points in W, right? You really need to get on your opponent, obviously, to kind of get that damage off, right? So if your opponent like can either have cooldowns up to dodge that or if they can kind of keep you at range, it can be quite difficult for you to actually trade and, and you'll kind of see that here. So I believe, I actually can't remember, I think he W to creep in this trade. Yeah, so actually, Pretty sure, actually, I'm not even sure. I think he W'd a creep here because Akali pressed the um, press the W in time. So this is kind of like the negative of trading um, when Akali has full cooldowns. I'm just gonna slow it down. I'm like, like pretty sure he W'd a creep, but I'm like not 100% sure. Yeah, okay, definitely W to creep here. So which that made that trade like kind of bad, honestly. Um, definitely not the best. So kind of like threw his lead a little bit with that trade but like ultimately it's kind of fine once again did get akali's long cooldowns out and you can actually see um you know like silas's cooldowns are back up akali's is still down so it can kind of zone her off the wave a little bit and this is like very different right like normally akali in this matchup can like crash this fairly easily and have a bounce back to her but instead is actually like really starting to face difficulties with her cooldowns down i'm not sure why um I honestly feel like QEQ is better if you want to do two points Q. I don't think QW... I mean, it, it depends, because, like, W allows you to cast Q again, which, like, makes sense, right? Like, if you have more points in Q, you kind of need the W energy. But at the same time, like, E is so good for Silas, because whenever he goes on you, you can always E to disengage, and then you can take it back if you want. So I much prefer E. Um, and I think here you'll kind of see, I think it's somewhere in here, you'll kind of see an example of like the tethering where um, Akali can kind of keep Silas at range and like Silas really wants to try, like get a little bit more here. Um, that wasn't quite the example I was thinking of. I know it's in here somewhere. I was watching this before. Yeah, so like here, this is like a really good example of it, right? So here, Silas has like, he has like a really strong W, like obviously W, very, very good trading tool at this point. Um, and so really wants to get onto Akali. But the problem is if Akali can like keep him at max range like this, you have Silas like walking forward, trying to find the W, doesn't want to E into her because now that she has E, like is going to take quite a lot of damage for it. 
And you can see, kind of just ends up taking a lot of damage for free, where he can't really quite find the engage onto Akali. So you can see here, actually takes quite a lot of damage for that one creep, and that puts it kind of like back into Akali's favor. Um, yeah, so like a lot of damage taken in this period. Now, it was at this point here, though, the scout got really greedy. So, ooh, I mean, I understand, like, I definitely get what, he, what he's going for here, but oh my god, like, because he's so low, right? If either one of them had traded slightly better, it could definitely go the complete other way, right? Like, if Scout played a little bit better, Zekka just dies here and there's, like, nothing else to it. Um, if Zekka had traded a bit better, like, maybe Scout doesn't even go for this in the first place. Um, but actually, oh, he flashes after him, ends up dying for it, and, like, this is insane to me. Like, Honestly, more than like a, more than as like an educational kind of like example, this is like really insane for kind of like the implications it had on worlds, right? Like you saw in this landing fight, in this landing phase, like how many little details added up, right? And all that added up to this solo kill being extremely close. And if I remember correctly, this was like game five of the series. Like it's very possible if this lane phase was played like slightly different by either either like you know, Zekka or uh, Scout, that this could have gone a different way. And then maybe because of that, like he doesn't end up getting like all these solo kills and carrying the game. So even at the highest level, and in fact, it's maybe especially at the highest level, like all these little details like matter a lot. And it's like the butterfly effect from these things, like potentially, like honestly, no one would, would know it at the time, right? but potentially like this little trade here could be the difference in world champions, right? I, I know this isn't really like, educational but I, I just always find it really like fascinating to talk about like the fact that you know if scout gets the solo kill and like he's the one that ends up carrying the game rather than like zek is the one who snowballs off this like 100 percent like edg could win game five and then like who knows how the finals goes right like the fact that potentially i don't know i'm kind of like nerding out about it now but if the, potentially the world championship comes down to like one skirmish like this i don't know i find that like really amazing that there's like one thing like oh 36 hp anyway that's enough kind of just yeah i mean i think it's really cool but okay back to the game so now it's um like i mean just look at the combat stat advantage like we've talked about this all throughout the matchups here it is pretty pretty far in silas's favor and one thing that zeka doesn't mess around with he doesn't buy costly items man he always buys the he buys the fucking biggest things he can buy He's out here to, to deal damage, and it's kind of like, yeah, like Akali can still win trades, and actually, um, I, I would say like right now, Akali can win trades if Silas goes too far into him, but Akali's in a really rough spot at the moment, because like as you, if you guys have watched this game, um, Silas ends up solo killing Akali like many times throughout the mid game, so the fact that she can no longer build up an advantage in the early game um, over this kind of champ is a very big problem, and in fact the only reason this matchup ends up even playable for Scout, I mean you can see how the trades are going here, is because Zekka ends up dying to a gank, um, and that obviously like it is like a major risk right if you play your lanes quite aggressively naturally the jungler will be looking at you um especially if you don't have flash like like you didn't have early but yeah like scout's actually kind of getting destroyed here and to be honest it, it is just really hard to recuperate from this like i mean once you're this far behind in terms of like combat stats it's just like very very difficult but ultimately i can kind of understand like why zeka ended up like pretty pushed here because he did have his like his karma right next to him but i think it's pretty soon here that he does get ganked by the sedge and he just gets like kind of one shot um yes i believe it's in here somewhere but like you can see right with his combat stats is just zoning akali like completely off the wave it was kind of interesting that he decided to push this wave because i think on one hand, it's like if your jungle is looking to be aggressive, you kind of want to push this, right? Like that makes a lot of sense. Um, at the same time, like you could afford to to freeze this knowing that like there's no way Sedge can help break it because you have your jungle next to him. I think ultimately did decide that like they, he, I think he would have kept this frozen if jungler didn't want to contest this crab, but because this crab was likely to be contested, probably decided to actually push this instead. And I think ultimately it did end up costing him, like kind of played a bit too aggressively. Sedge managed to come mid and kill him. and. That really like swung the matchup. I wouldn't say like into Scout's favor, but it definitely like evened up what was going to be like a very, very bad situation, right? Like it actually enabled him to kind of come back and play the game. So there honestly isn't too much else to this. I, I don't think the rest of the matchup is like particularly interesting, but I do think again, those first three levels, they really impact the game. Like every single game, um, the way the first three levels are being played, like impact the game a lot. And I think like the really smart cooldown punishments um, we're great this game also like a little bit of movement like to, to bait out some of the cooldowns but i actually think this one 
this matchup to me felt less like some of the other matchups right it really felt like Zeka was just like massively outplaying his opponent like he was doing like really smart decisions and stuff like that i do feel like this one scout did make some like fairly big mistakes like i'm i'm really not sure about the w level two in this matchup but i also think like greeting for that creep when his w was still on cooldown and losing like 300 hp for a 14 hp uh 14 gold minion is just like not really worth it so i still wanted to cover this one because i felt like it was like too exciting and it meant too much at worlds not to but i do think there's a bit less to learn from this one than the other ones but i think yeah, so what I'd take away from this game, kind of TLDR, again, those first three levels, they really matter a lot. Punishing cooldowns, it can be the difference between winning or losing a world championship, it would seem like, because if you imagine, right, like, let's just say it's like one of you guys playing this game, and you didn't punish um, Scout for, like, going, I don't know where it is, going for that one creep where he, it was like one range creep and he lost all his help for it. If you didn't go for that punish, like, you would probably just die um, at that trade here, right? And then, like, because of that, like, Akali's winning the lane, it would change the lane completely. So, these little things they really add up they really matter um so i think now i'm going to go on to kind of a tldr and also talk about like the rune thing a little bit as well i know it's been like a pretty long video um but yeah it's just like i really wanted to cover all this stuff because it, it was like super interesting i thought so finally we come to our tldr at the end if you have skipped here from earlier in the video there are also smaller tldrs at the end of each matchup but i'll try and you know Trying to summarize everything here. So first off was the levels 1 to 3. I think basically every game Zeka had a really immaculate levels 1 to 3. He clearly had a plan every time. And a lot of the times he won matchups that he really shouldn't have. Or at least made them more manageable. By some really clever level 1 plays. Like in that uh in the Silas. No I think it was the Akali versus Zia game. He did something at level 1 which was really nice. In the Oriana versus Zia game. He also did something that was very nice. Um, so those level ones, I made a big difference. And honestly, like one thing I would take away and something that I mentioned earlier in this video is that the levels one to three, especially I guess level one, that's the most important part of your lane because that affects the entire rest of it. If you get an advantage at this stage of the game, um, it gives you, you know, it gives you a better first base. And with your better first base, you know, you're heading items and XP. And that makes playing out the rest of the matchup quite a lot better. I've talked about that before, about how there's kind of this, um, this like ongoing effect of when you get a small advantage, you can build a much bigger one. And well, the first time you can really get a meaningful advantage is at level one. So if there's something from this to incorporate it into your games, it's really having a plan and knowing what you want to do for that levels like one to three. And also perhaps some stuff that you can do to make those some of those difficult matchups a bit more manageable the second thing was the matchup knowledge so this was definitely the thing that i think will be hardest for you guys to implement into your gameplay because this is something that in my mind comes after you've already like achieved very high levels with the fundamentals you know um to really understand like a lot of these matchups you have to just like know how the game works a lot of the time and also it's just something that is going to come with like extreme amounts of games you know like some of the things i saw here i don't know how many times this guy has played these matchups but i'm guessing like some of them are potentially in the hundreds you know if you think he's been playing champions like silas and akali for uh, probably several years now and he would have been practicing you know in korean solo queue or in scrims like most of the day uh most of that time so i i wouldn't doubt if he played like you know these matchups potentially more than 100 times each which is a lot obviously i would say i want to do a whole video on this just like what it is to know matchups and like how you can learn them and stuff and i think you know it's definitely something that i need to break down on in a different video but i think like for now the best thing i could say about it is like it's really important to know you know the, the kind of what are you gonna what are you gonna do with your wave like what items you are gonna build and all that but taking it to the extra step is like knowing like what intricacies of the matchup really make the difference you know is there a way you can trade um is there like is you know like for example the akali putting a point in w instead of e and like how that affects the matchup or like some stuff that you can do level one to completely change the matchup um, so this is definitely the most advanced one and it's it's hard to break down in just this i think if you want specifics like yeah watch the rest of the video um or i'm gonna yeah i'm, I'm definitely gonna make a video on that now the base timings this one was like really interesting so i think a lot of the base timings were were really nice like he'd actually go for the base first so and well one kind of like thing with a lot of the melee champs that he was playing is that you don't often get to just like force your opponent to base first and then um you know base without having to tp back like just because you don't have enough wave clear it's like hard to push the wave under the tower um so a lot of the time he would like push the wave under um and rather than just going for the base straight away he would either start his base in the bush and then he might bait his opponent into like canceling it and that 
enabled him to get a better base sometimes. Um, another thing was that he like, he would really make sure to base around certain kind of like item timings. Like I think that was one thing that was really clear about the matchup knowledge is he clearly knew like what those breakpoints were that he would have like much better items than his opponent um, in terms of combat power. And I do think actually something I'll talk about maybe a bit down here is like the itemization. I think a lot of the time he would just buy like pure combat power and a lot of the time his opponents, they'd be buying stuff that perhaps, you know, would help with skirmishes or perhaps would help a bit later in the game but weren't directly tied to the laning phase. Um, and that allowed him to build up some pretty big leads as well. Now, the next thing is adaptation. So this is another one that I feel like you kind of... This is more about like understanding the why behind things as opposed to the what. So the thing is, if you if you just understand like in a certain matchup or whatever that you just need to like crash three ways or you need to buy this item or you know you need to trade like this something like that, that is definitely like a big step. And in fact, that's like probably most of the way there. But the real the kind of the the thing that takes you beyond that point is really understanding the why behind things. Because if you understand the why behind you know like why we do certain things or why we play the matchups the way we do, um, it allows you to adapt and ways that can kind of like allow you to just get those extra inches that make the difference over like these other really great players right and I think examples of this were, you know, how he would change his wave control, like based on, you know, if your opponent had used like too much mana or something, um, or maybe like, um, you know, I remember him canceling his base multiple times in that Bush's Silas. Also some of the stuff like, um, you know, once he had a significant lead, like playing better like that. Another one was like when the jungle matchup um, ended up in a split map situation in that Graves and Kindred game. So just like all these little things, if you understand the why behind the fundamentals, like that's, that really allows you to take it to that extra level because um, there is just every league game is different right there's like a ton of different scenarios that play out and the reason that we learn the fundamentals in the way we do is because we're trying to apply like some sort of learning that can help you in the most games possible right if we improve something like our wave control you are going to have wave control every one of your games and that's like really helpful right um, but obviously a, every game is like slightly different. There's like a couple things that you could maybe change. You know, there's some tweaks you can do here and there. There are things that might not go as expected. The matchup might be impacted by external factors like the supports and jungles. And so all those things, those lead to adaptation. And if you can adapt really well, um, that can make those a lot better for you. So this is a hard one, again, to kind of break down. It could be worth doing a video on this as well. Let me know if that's something you guys want to see. But I think um, what I would take away from it is just how important it is to know the reason that you do things. You know, the decision making that goes into these like just think about the why behind you doing things like why do i buy this item you know why do i control the wave like this i think that'll allow you to come to just like yeah just like a greater knowledge of like why we do certain things and i think i'll just make you a more complete player overall the last thing is the rune itemization minigame and mainly focusing on the runes so one thing that's happened this year right is that as people took more sustained runes early game runes became less valuable, right? So if you take, um, let's say you take Fleet and Second Wind and Doran Shield. Into that, there's kind of no point taking Scorch because like Scorch is a rune that only really makes a difference when it's the difference between like either getting a kill or forcing someone to base. Like Scorch in terms of just the absolute damage it deals honestly isn't too important. You know, sometimes 50 damage from Scorch might actually be more impactful than 150 damage from Scorch, just depending on what makes a difference. You know, if that ends up you getting a kill or if it forces them into, um, into basing or something. And the thing is, when everyone was taking the early game runes, well, suddenly taking early game runes of your own, like Scorch and Aerie and stuff like that, it became not that useful. So what people did is they kind of, the metagame shifted. They were like, okay, there's just like too much early game power for me to get to. So they're going to go for more scaling runes. So you see more first strikes, you see more like inspiration secondary, you just see more scaling runes in general and kind of a move away from a lot of these like either early game runes or early game keystones. Um, and so that had kind of shifted like all the, the, the complete other way. You see Akali's would pretty much never take fleet anymore. They'd only take Conqueror. Um, you'd see Victor's no longer going for Airy. They'd mainly be going for First Strike. Depending on depending on the matchup, you'd sometimes still see Azir taking early game runes, but you'd also see it wouldn't be like uncommon to see Azir with first strike either. Um, so there was like more of a trend, like as the year went on, of you know, we can't get through this early power, so we're just gonna go for as much scaling as we can possibly get, right? And the thing is that it had kind of shifted so far in the opposite direction that it was like, okay, now people have gotten so greedy with their rune pages that if I just take this like full early game page, you know, you saw the Oriana with the Airy and the second wind. Um we saw 
uh, you know, like the early game, I think it was, yeah, Fleet Akali taking into the um, Azir, and what else did we see? I think there was also, I think in the, the matchup that Faker played, he didn't quite have enough damage, like with his first strike to get through um, the Silas early game sustain, so it was like stuff like that. I just thought that was really interesting of like how initially, you know, it was like the runes were one way, and then because of like the meta, it was like too hard to take early game runes, you couldn't get through the sustain, then it kind of went all the other way of people just taking like super scaling pages, and suddenly those super scaling pages made them vulnerable, and I think that was really interesting, is because I think if everyone is taking the early game runes, then early game runes kind of don't translate into everything, but if some people take scaling runes, then there's actually a chance for these early game runes to actually make a difference, and Zeka pretty much always just went for the strongest early game setup in terms of runes, and I itemization that he could possibly get you know he would go for lots of early game power make sure he's spending all that gold on combat stats wouldn't be worrying too much about the skirmishes worrying more about the 1v1s and i think that was just a really interesting thing to point out um because yeah it actually it made a big difference at the end and i think yeah it's kind of like an interesting thing to think about right how like your runes well there's like in theory an optimal set of runes like for your champion right it somewhat depends on what you're thinking your opponent's going to take. And I think that's just like a really interesting thing about like competition in general is like, it, it's different from solo queue, right? You have the opportunity to research your opponent. You can see their habits. You can see um, the kind of play style or runes that they might typically run. And then kind of just like, there's this whole extra component of the game, like beyond um, the actual gameplay itself that kind of happens before the game with terms of the research, you know, the scouting, the countering, all that sort of stuff. I thought that was very interesting. Um, yeah, anyway, so I thought you might, guys. Thought you guys might find that interesting too. So, guys, that's going to be it for this video. I did end up a long one, and I decided that was kind of just best overall. I was thinking about just splitting it up into different parts, but I thought, you know, the new season is tomorrow. I kind of just want to get this, like, all out of the way, um, you know, kind of get season 12 behind us, looking toward the new season. And the other reason was, as more than just an educational video, I really wanted to kind of share with you guys, like, how... Um, you know, how, how well Zeka did in the laning phase. Like this was, this is really what makes me like excited about League of Legends, I guess. You know, it's these matchups that are played to such a high level where there's like all these different details and just like really, really like good play, honestly. It's um in a way like, I get kind of tired in of League sometimes, but I always feel like when at Worlds is like this really high level play, that's what I enjoy most. And hopefully I could share that kind of love for that part of the game with you guys as well. Um, but yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comment section below. Sorry again that it was so low, and I will see you guys in the next season.